Do I need to say anything coronavirus, coronavirus? Wash hands, wash hands, wash hands, wash hands, and wash hands some more with soap. Okay, I think really that is the, the bottom line. To be careful when we are out amongst people we don't know, uh, but to be sensible and safe and sane. I kind of wondered, do I change my whole sermon to be a coronavirus sermon? I didn't know which Bible passage I was going to particularly choose. And so we're carrying on with Ephesians, and I'm going to ask Jamie if you can bring up the Bible reading. You'll see that we've taken out the hymn books and the Bibles to try and uh, limit the amount of places where we put our hands and pass on the germs. Uh, I, I gather from the early service that I've... I've preaching on a few extra verses. I'm not supposed to do all that way, so I'm not sure about the preachers for next week. I might have made things a bit confusing for them. We'll see. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 17. I need to try and remember this is being recorded for those that couldn't come, so I have to try and be respectable. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learnt. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So I mentioned last week very briefly that we hit the middle passage of Ephesians last week and we had spoken before then of how Jesus gave himself for us and rescued us and brought us to salvation and made us one body. And in the previous weeks I've spoken as if we are all traveling on a journey and that there's these fences on the side, huh? And on the signs of these fences it says, do not trespass. Because we know that if we cross over that fence and go on the other side, then that's where we are sinning. And as the do not trespass signs are there, then we must stay in the middle to journey with God. And we also spoke as we talked about Gentiles and Jews, how some were traveling with less guidance and others were guided by the Old Testament and God had the Jews traveling in a group, all one together. But when Jesus died for us, It was to make us all one, so that we're all on one journey. And now as we get into this part of Ephesians, Paul is giving some very specific instructions for that journey. When we talk about community, and we have this word community, and we are one, but here are some very specific instructions about how to live in community. So let me give us an example. Grant and I went out to Betty's Bay. And so as we drove to Betty's Bay, we go along the N2. And you can imagine the N2 is quite a busy road, even now with the virus and whatever. The N2 has got lots of cars, and those cars are all going in the same direction, all taking the same journey. Now, would you say that that is community? (laughs) No. (laughs) 
We were joking about saying, how do you keep social distancing when you're in a traffic jam? You keep all your cars so many meters apart. But it's not community, is it? We're all just there. And that is why people can cut in front of each other and swear and make signs out the windows. Because we don't see each other as community. We're just all cars. We happen to be going in the same way. It's not a community. But then while we were in Betty's Bay, Grant and I, it was just the two of us there, and our dogs went for a walk on the beach. And Grant and I walked next to each other, and we're chatting as we're going along and talking about the dogs. Now, is that community? Yes. Even though it was just Grant and me, maybe it would be better community if we had all our children there, even better community if we had the whole church there walking along the beach chatting. But you can see there's a difference in community. It's not just people being together. Community requires cooperation and interaction. So when Grant takes off his shoes and puts on his shoes, because he's got these shoes that take a long time to put on and put off, me and the dog stop and wait for him. And when Finn gets a harness in a tangle and Cap wants to run off, he has to wait because we're untangling Finn's harness. And we wait for each other and we talk together and we support each other. And if I fell and broke my leg, Grant would carry me back. <laughs> he says he would. <laughs> But you can see that there is community and there is not community. And this whole coronavirus thing really brings home this idea that we need each other for community. We cannot, although we talk about social distancing, we cannot actually survive through this crisis on our own. We need each other. And so let's just have a look very briefly, because I promised the services would be short, at these specific things that Paul has told us. So he starts with these specific rules. And if you look through it, you can see these. And we hear them a million times. Speak the truth. Don't tell lies to one another. Now, instead of just hearing that as a general thing, let's think about this community. Think about the people that you're sitting with. Do we make an effort to always speak the truth to the people sitting around us? Sometimes, to be honest, we don't talk much to the people sitting around us, and so there's not much to say. But would we be tempted to lie in order to save face or to save us from embarrassment? Or would we have the courage to actually speak the truth to each other in all times? Don't hold on to anger. Somebody offends us, and this happens easily at church because we have a misunderstanding and somebody gets offended and you know how we like to do it, and we think about it, and we're lying in bed at night, and we're playing over that episode again and again, and we boil ourselves up, and we get angrier and angrier. We say, how could they do it to me? I can see these 17 reasons why they were wrong, and I'm just so cross. And we know it actually just hurts us, because the other person doesn't have a clue what you're doing, but you are just boiling yourselves up. And Paul says, don't hold on to that. Let it go. If we are in community... We're going to hurt each other. We're going to offend each other by mistake. It's going to happen. Let's not hold on to that. Let's let it go. And so as you think of the people around you, the people that aren't here right now because they're self-isolating, is there anybody they are actually holding a bit of anger against? This community. In this community, we need to forgive. We need to let it go. And then it carries on. Don't steal don't be plain ugly to each other. No insulting, no nastiness, no malice, no brawling, no rage, no anger. Just plain be nice to each other. I've brought in here, be, be aware of others and care for others. Straightforward, easy. We all do it, right? Okay, how about this? I was on Clicks on Friday. And Clicks is a war zone at the moment. Huh? Any place that sells hand sanitizer is a war zone at the moment. So there seems like lots of toilet paper, but hand sanitizer, no. But I'm just at Clicks because I want to buy headache pills. So I'm standing at the prescription counter because I need to get over the counter. And there's about three of us, I think, standing there being served. And some very brave person comes from behind the counter, is digging around in the storeroom, and she's found about three little bottles of hand sanitizer. And she comes out, and she's holding it up in her hand, and she says, well, she doesn't actually even say anything. She just holds it up. And you can see that she's intending to share it amongst the people standing there in the queue waiting, thinking we all want hand sanitizer. But the person that is very closest to her grabs and says, I need them all, and takes them. And we know that that's selfish and not nice. 
but it's kind of what comes out of us sometimes in a, in a crisis like now with this coronavirus, where we feel that I've got to have it, I've got to look after myself. Our encouragement as we live in community is to be aware of the person that is outside of me. It is not just me, it is not just my family, but that there is a community beyond us to be aware and to care and to look beyond. And so these rules for community aren't just instructions that God's put there to make life difficult for us. They're instructions that we can live together and support each other and grow together. Paul goes on, well, in this passage, he gives us some general rules as well. He says, be sensitive to God. He says the Gentiles have lost track of God. Those that are not following God, they have become desensitized to the things that God wants. And they're just living for themselves. It says for all sensual things. So they will rather have chocolate cake than go to church. You know? They will rather have sex with some random person than uh, meet in community with a Christian. And the challenge to us is to say, are we sensitive to God? Are we sensitive to the way that God has made the world in a moral structure? To say there's a way that works and there's a way that causes damage and destruction. You know I have a granddaughter. <laughs> now this granddaughter, I have these toys that I play with her with in my little grandom bag that is a special toy. And one of these toys is a recorder. It's a plastic cheap recorder. And I bought it for her so she could just learn to blow. I wasn't worried that she learned to play in tune or anything. And when she was quite little, she actually learned to blow it very nicely. But she has this fixation that if you can blow it the one way, you must be able to turn it around and blow it the other way. And you know that you can't. <laughs> A recorder only blows if you blow on that narrow side. You try and blow on the other way, it won't work. And Matilda, every single time you take it out, she will blow it and make it work and then spend the rest of the time trying to make it work the wrong way. Too often we are like that in our lives. We do something and it doesn't work and we want to spend the rest of our lives trying that same thing to make it work. Where God is saying to us, turn the stupid thing around and do it the right way. The universe is made by Jesus to work in a way where we are community, where we love each other and we work together with each other. But sometimes we just need to turn around the way we think and do it the right way. And Matilda has grown from being quite a selfish little brat to where if I gave her the recorder, I was never getting it back until she got interested in something else, to now she has learned to share nicely. And so if you give her the recorder, she will look at it, she'll blow it the wrong way around for a moment, and she'll give it back to me and say, Grandom, you know, she can't talk, but you know how to make it work. You do it nicely. It gives me a chance to show her. And I think we all of us are more than 13 months old. We all of us have that ability to look beyond and to become sensitive to God. And Paul gives us some other instructions. He says, don't let the devil get a foothold. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And we know in our hearts that there are things that we do that let Satan in. There are things that we do that hurt God. Let us be sensitive. Let's use those things that Paul tells us. And then just to pick up that very last verse where Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Be kind and compassionate. And particularly now I just want to bring it home to this coronavirus thing. To understand that people have very different ideas about how to respond. We see even amongst churches, there are some churches that say, no, we're not going to meet. They prefer to take what we would call a prophetic stance, to say we believe we must set a good example and that we should stay away from people to kill this virus. There are other churches, such as we are, who say, you know what, at this time people need Jesus. We need to come together. And Jesus would never turn people away. For us, to be kind and compassionate means that we accept that some people feel like that and others people feel like this. It's okay. We can both serve God in these different ways. Some people need to self-isolate. Some people know that they feel vulnerable. They don't want to get sick and they're afraid of getting sick. And so they're not here right now. That's okay. We can be kind and compassionate and love them. Other people say, 
I'm coming out because I want to be with my Christian people. I need some human contact. I need this moment. That's fine. We are kind and compassionate to people like that as well. To understand the different responses and the different ways that we are. But also, as we are kind and compassionate, to figure out how we can actually look after people that are struggling. You know, we've heard about people that hoard the toilet paper and the hand sanitizer and whatever, but now what about people that are suddenly in lockdown at retirement homes? What about people who have decided I need to self-isolate because I'm vulnerable? What about people who are suddenly in quarantine and they're part of our community? And I'm asking us, in our shepherd groups, everybody should be part of a shepherd group to be aware if there's somebody in your shepherd group that is self-isolating or in quarantine, and to say to them, have you got everything that you need? Not thinking that we must start doing money, but to say maybe we need to take some of the toilet paper that we've hoarded away, (laughs) or whatever, we'll go to the shops and buy toilet paper, because there's lots in the shop, and say, well, just drop it at your gate. You come and fetch it later but to be aware that there are people amongst us. I don't know what I would do if suddenly I had to be self-isolated because I couldn't go to the shops. And as soon as I'm self-isolated, the family is self-isolated, then I would definitely be saying, somebody, please bring me Coke. Can't survive without Coke. You know what I mean, (laughs) whatever it might be. So please just, just listen in our shepherd groups. To listen in our shepherd groups also for those who are losing out because they can't work at this time. Those that everything's been cancelled because of coronavirus. Those who don't have an income. And to say, I don't, again, let's not give money to one another, but to say, if I can buy a bag of groceries, if I can do something to help, let's listen. And those shepherd groups are ways that we can know. And I know some of us feel, oh, the shepherd group is just there. Now is the opportunity to use it. Now is the time where you can just say, even if you're not the leader of the group, Hey, is everybody on this group okay? Can I bring bring anybody anything? Does anybody need anything? To make sure that every single person in this community is cared for. And beyond that, to look at people beyond the community. To look at those that have to work, that are forced to go in taxis and public transport. Those that are forced to work in shops and come into contact with people. To say, how can we help? What can we do? So perhaps we start with our community, but also aware of the world outside. And so that last verse really has it for me, where Paul says to us, be kind and compassionate to one another. Amen.